Her teaching and research focus on the intersection of international politics, technology, and national security. Dr. Krebs is a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and a life member at the Council on Foreign Relations. She has a BA from Harvard, MSc from Oxford, and PhD from Georgetown. Between 1999 and 2003, she served as an active duty officer in the United States Air Force. In today's seminar, Sarah will discuss the potential and risk of artificial intelligence technologies being integrated into consumer products and everyday experiences, specifically in the political sphere. Um, before I let Sarah start, just quickly a few logistics. Um, for our audience online, you can use Zoom chat to message the group. But if you'd like to ask a question, please submit it on Slido. You can find the instructions for that on the website. Um, so Slido also has a nice upvote feature, um, which you can use to help us prioritize questions. And then after the presentation, we will move to the Q&A portion of the seminar, where we'll have both online and in-person questions from the in-person audience. OK, Sarah, take it away. Thank you, Chris. Can everyone hear me OK? Uh, it's a real honor to be here. Um, I've been uh, hearing a little bit about the work that's going on here at High, and it's uh, so interesting. The, the interdisciplinary nature of the work is really cutting edge, and, and it's really been great to meet people and hear about the work that's being done here. Um, and I will say that if there's a timelier topic than AI and politics, it would be hard. I'd be hard pressed uh, to find one. And so it's an exciting thing to be talking about. We're all missing, I guess, some congressional hearings on this uh, topic, and I missed them yesterday because I was on a plane. Um, but so I'll just kind of talk a little bit about uh, the intellectual and policy genealogy of the project and then go into kind of the, the meat of uh, the research uh, that I'll be, um, that I've done and that I continue to, to do in this area. Um, and so actually it's really interesting because it, some of my interest in this did start uh, with a congressional hearing when the CEO of what's now Meta, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, was on Capitol Hill. And there was this question about the 2016 election and foreign interference and the, a lot of kind of back and forth, which now I've seen this echoed over the, I guess, the last five years of a tech CEO on Capitol Hill uh, talking to members of Congress who clearly don't really understand the technology. I mean, the number of times in the TikTok hearing that members of Congress referred to Tic Tacs uh, was not encouraging. Um, and I think we saw this with this exchange is that, you know, Zuckerberg saying, well, how do we make money? We run ads. And it was this very sort of business model that opened the U.S. as a democracy to the possibility of foreign influence. Uh, just it's something that we use every day and that, that there was this sort of a, not a lack of awareness about the ways in which that could intersect with politics. And so what we know from the Senate intelligence reports that followed is that this idea, the sort of malice around the world was not going away. And that because we're democracy, this would continue to happen but that these actors would try to find more sophisticated ways to do it. So what I look at, and all of this tees up this research, is that can, what are these new ways? Uh, and can AI-generated text now intersect with the motive, the foreign motive to insinuate themselves in a US political context? Can that scale? Can that be used to manipulate? Can it be weaponized? But can it also, can AI-generated text also be used for the public interest? And so what I'll talk about over the course of this, these next uh, minutes is that, yes, uh, AI-generated text is credible. I'll show that it, through a number of different uh, studies I've done. Um, but that it also has uh, political consequences that are both uh, salutary but also kind of destructive. And so the awareness of both the perils and prospects, I think, are the right place to start to be able to anticipate and institute necessary guardrails. So the agenda is pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, talk about generative AI and political communication, starting with the misuse cases, this, this set of questions of can generative text be used 
or misuse? Is it credible? Can it scale? And I'll talk about experiments I've done with the public, po um, political ma manipulation of the public, but then also potentially political elites themselves. And then I'll switch to a possibly more optimistic note of uh, ways that generative AI might be able to be used in the public uh, for the public interest. Uh, so one of the just a little nomenclature here. So I refer to uh, political communication here in this context of AI me uh, mediated communication. So the use of machines to modify, augment, or generate messages on behalf of the communicator. So a lot of the previous research on this had been done on sort of consumer platforms like Grammarly or Airbnb um, and questions about the biases and risks of homogenizing communities by using these, these big data sets. And, and, uh, but until uh, starting to work on this in 2018, the political context had been relatively ignored, I think almost entirely ignored by researchers. Uh, and so my background in that intersection of national security and emerging tech um, approached this really this question from the perspective of that national security risk and international politics. And since it's a an interdisciplinary group, I'll just walk through some of the the kind of the the uh, literature from from my discipline on this, which is that the media, uh, when we think about national security, is really at the center of everything, this whole sort of web of activity. So we have events, foreign events that are feeding into the media. We have foreign actors influencing public opinion. And what we know in a democracy is that public opinion can have both a bottom up effect in influencing the political agenda, but also that the media can affect public opinion. So you have a lot of arrows that kind of go multiple ways. And these authors, whose work I really respect, they said in 2008, in a very important piece, they said, basically, this web of arrows has become so dense, and we should just stop studying this, these relationships because we're really, every all the articles are becoming really derivative. And as, um, they said, actually, there's a, a typo here. In 2019, they updated, a decade, a decade later, they said, the, they, you know, kind of, they threw up their hands. They said, wow, this environment has... The information environment has changed so much and academic research hasn't kept pace. Uh, maybe it hadn't kept pace because they had told all of us we shouldn't be working on it anymore. Uh, but, but they uh, were increasingly aware that things had changed and now we needed to understand these relationships in new ways. And what I suggest here is that with kind of this national security lens, they were missing an arrow. So what they didn't have in this original um, kind of schematic was the way in which foreign actors would influence mass media. And that's exactly what can happen in a, a democracy, an open media marketplace of ideas. And that's especially the case given what we knew was happening with the information environment. And so what was different with this shift to social media and I know we, we could put up hundreds of figures that show that no one's really reading newspapers anymore and they're all getting their news online. The real question here is why that matters and whether that's really different from traditional media environments. And I think a couple of things are different. One is the openness, the open access of it. You know, if you think about the New York Times, they have editors, not anyone can post in the New York Times. Um, but anyone can post on, uh, on Medium or anyone can post on, on a website in ways that can go viral. And the network effect means that one post can ripple and be seen around the world in a matter of seconds. Uh, and one of the other things that uh, I was talking to some people before this talk about um, TikTok and questions of policy surrounding TikTok is that um, what we know from the online environment, it's also very addictive. And these algorithms tap into behavioral psychology findings that lure you online, keep you there, and then cause you to share things that may or may not be true. And so again, kind of thinking about this, this new media environment and thinking about what happened in 2016 and the aftermath of that, kind of the post-mortem investigation of how can we make sure that in the future, 
uh, this doesn't happen again. And so I'm referencing here again this 2018 report that talks about these the Russians in the Internet Research Agency masquerading as Americans and then generating content and false news stories and attempting to deceive millions of social media users. So what we know, though, is that they did attempt this, um, but a lot of cases they didn't do it very well. Um, so we have a clear misuse motive uh, in, in kind of legal terms. There is a clear motive here and a misuse motive. Um, and I cite here some uh, examples that I think um, indicate that they weren't very good at this, but that they tried, but these are a bit more egregious. You know, these ways in which you look at these, this content, and if you're a native speaker, you can just tell that this is not written by a native speaker, right? So in America, you have right to bear arms. I mean, we don't really... You, you would, you, it, little things, like you, would, you have a right to bear arms. So again, thinking about the late 2010s, teens or whatever, 2018, uh, I went to uh, an uh, interdisciplinary conference um, in D.C. with OpenAI. And they didn't present this, but they presented the early version of this, so GPT-2. And the wheels started turning my head. I thought... Wait, if you have now these, if you have generative AI, we have these large language models, can this then be the way that outside actors who are attempting foreign influence can get around some of those telltale signs that this was written by a Russian guy in St. Petersburg? Or can it get around one of the things that was, um, I think, a finding from the, this internet research agency in St. Petersburg is they work 12 hours a day and they're just kind of mindlessly trying to meet their quotas. And with one click now, if you can just put in a, write a pro, uh, uh, I actually tried to do this and this foreshadows some of the guardrails. I said, write a pro Russia uh, op-ed about the Ukraine war and um, OpenAI doesn't let you do that. Uh, they say that is not in their, uh, th 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 that's not something they're capable of doing. Um, but what you can do is generate a lot of content and you can do it quickly. And so uh, some of these early proofs of concept, and Miles McCain is in this room, he's now a Stanford computer science student, um, we're really trying to generate kind of an initial proof of concept. Uh, so Again, a lot, there wasn't much work done on this. At the time, um, we joined in as the early, uh, some early academic collaborators with OpenAI, and they were interested in this sort of the, these political questions. Would people find stories about nuclear uh, politics in North Korea to be convincing? Um, how does the human detection of this look? And so that was really the gist of this early research, but it was based on GPT-2, which we know is much less powerful than GPT-3 and 4, which is the, obviously the most powerful. But nonetheless, what we found, what we found will surprise you, um, what we found will not probably surprise you, which is that all of these models, even these ones now that just look puny by comparison, were credible. So people would read these stories and register on a range of different credibility measures, whether they thought they were credible. All of them were credible. And the most powerful ones, which again are small by comparison with GPT-4, were statistically indistinguishable from a randomized uh, exposure to a New York Times story on which it was based. So then the question is, well, sort of, again, looking ahead, if, if looking to the future, we could already see that these models were getting better by the day, almost literally. Would the credibility of this increase linearly? And so we did another set of studies, and this is basically the credibility distribution where you can see here, I don't know if I have a laser, um, but this one is the least capable one. And you can see then that the two most capable ones were relatively indistinguishable. So there wasn't like a linear, log linear increase, um, but what we could see was that these were getting, that, 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 the, that shift from this one, uh, the 300, 355 um, 
the smallest model at the time uh, was not that good. So I just give a few examples. So we, just imagine we put in the first sentence of a New York Times story here about North Korean nuclear policy. And the hallucination that this GPT-2 churned out is impressively bad. So how you go from North Korean nuclear weapons to glorious Easter cakes in French, but not that green. Um, so others were a little bit more subtle, uh, like making um, factual errors about a member of Congress with the wrong committee name. Uh, where again, if you're a political observer, as I was, I, I knew that was wrong. But you know, any of you, and I'm sure all of you have uh, played around with ChatGPT, it all sounds pretty plausible. Right, and so the reference like um, Congressman Ted Liu, chairman of the Congressional Foreign Trade Committee. There is no Foreign Trade Committee, but if you're reading this, it sounds like, oh yeah, that's like that sounds like who he is. Um, so you could see that in a. Um, so I included some of the open-ended comments that we got about uh, these models, which I think again foreshadowed kind of where we are today and why this is such a plausible misuse case. People who are reading news stories are looking for markers like, oh, there were specifics and quotes. Um, there was supporting evidence. It seems very believable. And then you can see how politics can intersect with this. So all bets are off with Trump as president. His foreign policy is irrational at best. And so you read this story and it's like, oh, and this story generated an output that made it look like Trump was about to bomb North Korea. And it's like, yeah, that's, that seems uh, plausible. Uh, so you do see here at the bottom on the left, so if you read the story, it makes no sense. This person was particularly astute, although I don't think they had to be. It talks about the US North Korea fighting too long and bitter nuclear wars. Hopefully, Americans would know that that hasn't happened. Uh, but we also know that a lot of Americans can't find Ukraine on a map. So finding these errors, the digital literacy to detect this is, is um, not terribly high here the way it might be in places like Finland. Um, so let me shift now to this question of political elites. So we have in our democratic process this bottom-up and top-down dynamic. And we should worry about the effect of foreign interference manipulating American public opinion and attitudes on politics. But we should also worry about that agenda setting possibility. So this next uh, part is a study that looked at this question of whether generative AI can uh, essentially set the legislative agenda through astroturfing. So creating again at scale this sense that, wow, there's overwhelming support um, for banning TikTok or whatever. So could that be pulled off? And um, this is from a story from uh, late March where members of Congress were saying um, that they found AI was intimidating and dangerous, but they really don't understand it very well. But we do know, and again, kind of open democratic processes, that there is a precedent for trying to flood a comment line uh, with inauthentic content. So in spring 2017, the FCC opened its comment line to, um, on the issue of net neutrality. And what they found later was that um, so many of the comments, only 6% of the comments were unique. And, and so this started to, and, and a lot of them were public, or, um, they were posted in a very small window. So again, what do we know about these technologies? If your marker before was, wow, someone was spamming these with cut and paste of the same content, ChatGPT is going to sidestep that because every one of these outputs will look unique. So we have this question and this fundamental relationship uh, between constituents and their elected officials. We're in a representative democracy. That means there are cases where members of Congress are going to do what they think is in the public interest, but they also want to get reelected and, to do, and, they, and want to represent the interests of their people. 
But how do they do that? One of the big ways is through written correspondence. And we know from previous research that emails, not really letters anymore, have been shown to set the legislative agenda. So what if you could use AI to essentially astroturf and give the impression of a set of uh, support for a set of policies? Uh, so uh, what we did in this case, and these are side-by-side -side letters, uh, I had um, some students from the Cornell Political Union write a set of advocacy letters on different topics. An example of that is uh, one of these. And then we trained GPT-3 uh, to generate then hundreds of right-wing gun control letters and left-wing reproductive rights letters. And then we randomly uh, sent a total of 32,000 emails to 7,000 members of state Congress. And the reason we did that is because obviously, I mean, the law of numbers, which is we wanted a, a large sample. And so uh, it wasn't totally encouraging. Oh, no. I will, I'll just, as someone tries to fix this, um, talk through the results. Um, which is that, first of all, uh, response rates were quite low. And what that suggests, I think, it should be obvious, which is that members of Congress are overwhelmed. And they, their inboxes um, are, thank you. Um, they, uh, thanks. They have a real challenge in inbox management. And so the response rates were about 17%. Uh, it was during the pandemic. But in all of, the, so on um, the issue of policing and reproductive rights and taxes, um, the response rates for the AI generated content was lower, but on three issues, it was statistically indistinguishable, which suggests that, uh, and, and these kinds of audit or field experiments have been uh, conducted in a number of different con, um, domains, you know, the, the type where you want to see whether members of Congress are racist, so you kind of randomly send, you know, uh, certain names and 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 try to elicit sort of based on response rates whether they're more likely to respond to one group demographic group than another. And here again, you know, we we were very aware of kind of the ethical concerns of sending uh, AI generated text to members of Congress, but the reason we did it is because. We imagine that if you ask a member of Congress, do you think you can tell? Like, of course, you know, social desirability bias or tech kind of desirability bias, they're going to say, yeah, of course I can tell. They can't. Um, and so that raises, I think, some important questions and issues about kind of where we go with that um, in this, in sort of the democratic process. So then what we've Kind of tried to think about is this question of generative AI in the public interest. And so the problem here is that elected leaders need to represent their uh, constituents, um, but again, they're really busy. If their response rates right now are 17%, that means that they are challenged to maintain a genuine congressional citizen discourse. Um, we've talked now to a lot of members of Congress about these issues about this question, about the possibility of using AI in this context. And what I was really surprised to find out is that um, they, they're not concerned about AI writing back to constituents because they said, right now it's staffers that are essentially, they have a pool of let's say 30 uh, replies, boilerplate replies. So they get an email about, wow, why are the taxes so high in California? And then the staffer will basically pull from the sort of the cognitive associative thinking, taxes too high, and they're going to drag over the response from that. So this isn't like meaningful citizen uh, constituent engagement. Um, and so it's actually possible, and this is sort of the premise, that these tools, this generative AI, might actually give people more meaningful engagement and give the feeling that they, they are more heard. So we've looked at this now um, in uh, 
a couple of different settings. Um, this is a study that we did on Twitter. Um, and so this is a really interesting case because uh, maybe some of you recognize the late uh, Senator Gravel from Alaska. And this guy was kind of an epic, you know, very charismatic kind of populist. Well, in uh, about 2015 or so, these two teenagers uh, approached him and said, you know, uh, Senator, um, we think that you're a really kind of dynamic force for good, but you really need to be on Twitter. And, uh, th and, and they persevered, like good kind of Stanford students is like, they're not going to take no for an answer. I'm not saying they were Stanford, but that sort of mentality of like tech and the public interest. Um, and so they persevered and then basically convinced uh, Mike Gravel to give them, hand over his hitter, Twitter handle to these two teenagers. Uh, and, you know, the reason why he was willing to do that, I guess these, these individuals were um, persuasive, but that members of Congress know that this is a way of connecting with people. And I think that we can see very clearly that this is something that AOC has done to great effect, so much so that she now leads training with her uh, colleagues to more meaningfully use social media to connect with with constituents. So what we did here, uh, and again, what we were trying to see is whether um, not so much, not, definitely not a misuse case, although you could flip this to see how this might be potentially misused, um, is whether essentially people, um, again, overworked members of Congress and their staff could use these language models to generate um, meaningful tweets uh, that also kind of help uh, sort of encourage more engaged political behavior. And so what we did, we started with a corpus of actual tweets using a simple Twitter API keyword search on the economy and climate change and one on business. So then we used GPT-3 uh, to generate, again, these kind of three different sets of um, tweets and then showed, again, randomly uh, the question of whether individuals could distinguish between these. But really, more importantly, because it's pretty clear now that people can't distinguish whether it's tweets, whether it's an Airbnb profile, or whether it's a New York Times story. These models are, are so good that that, I think, is not a very interesting study anymore. Um, so we generated these tweets uh, and wanted to see what the political behavioral consequences were, whether people could be kind of roused to political action through these. So again, not surprising that the vernacular here is great. Um, this uh, red one is, is one of the AI-generated tweets. And I mean, it looks pretty good. It looks like something you might see on, on Twitter. Uh, so... This one was interesting because we did find that machine written, um, AI written tweets were less likely to seem real. Um, however, the, the, and, and I will say too that social media, at the lowest levels of social media use, the proportion of individuals who thought the tweets were real was indistinguishable. But <laughs> what I found very interesting here is that as your social media use, which, you know, people who, are a five on the social media index, um, willingness to share or like or retweet. We're basically as willing to, to share or re retweet the AI-generated tweets as the human-generated tweets. And what was really interesting as well, so what we were looking for here was the proportion of spending allocated to let's say, environmental policies. So we asked people, imagine the government had $100 to spend. You can spend either zero on the economy or 100 on the environment or 100 on the economy and zero on the environment. How would you like to distribute the spending on the environment versus the economy? And so we asked them also about their likelihood of engaging in a number of different political activities. Would you go to a rally? Would you write a constituency letter? Would you make a financial contribution? Would you get involved formally or informally? And what was very interesting to me here is that political, sorry, this should be, uh, no, yeah. So spending money on the environment here was the same regardless of whether it was a GPT-3 or human-generated email. 
Um, this is the involvement in politics one, where you can see actually what I, again, find kind of interesting here is that uh, people were actually, uh, even though these weren't necessarily statistically significant, GPT-3 had the effect of making people more likely to engage politically than the human-generated content. So what it could suggest is that if the goal is kind of meaningful political engagement of an otherwise apathetic uh, constituency, that these language models could be used to salutary effect. So what I want to turn to uh, in the next few minutes is kind of how we want to how we might think about the guardrails or what this all means in terms of kind of democracy um, and political environment uh, involvement. Um, and so kind of coming back to this question of the political elites and the sort of deceptive nature, potentially deceptive nature of these technologies. One way to think about this, because this is something then, you know, as um, this research has kind of, um, I don't know, gained some visibility, the question we were getting asked was, well, so what should we do about this? And how can members of Congress guard against this possible kind of astroturfing through AI-generated text at scale? And I think one sort of outcome of this could be uh, that members of Congress kind of, uh, and I'm not saying go, this is the lower text solution, but that they engage in other ways. And so, um, you know, this was a New York Times story for a couple of years ago with uh, one of my senators, um, Chuck Schumer, which is that if you think about calling, I mean, I suppose you could try to use uh, sort of AI to uh, manipulate and scale. It's harder to scale. Like, how do you do this equivalent by calling and inundating your member of Congress with, with phone calls. It's a lot harder and it's an, another way to kind of connect directly with your member of Congress so that he can still hear these constituent concerns. Because again, we have to take a step back and think about what is the goal here? The goal is for members of the populace to be heard and for members of our Congress to know what their constituents think. And so here's another way. So this is essentially is the upshot of this is like take out the middle activity of the social the, the the email and call or go to a town hall. So find ways that are honestly more personal, more direct to connect in this democratic process. Um, here's the example of, um, or here's another way. Sorry, um, the, and, a, and a sort of project that I was talking to a few people about. Uh, before um, before this talk, which is the sort of how do we want to think about kind of a package of generative AI capabilities that actually might be uh, providing a public good? And so if you think about kind of what is it that these members of Congress are faced with, they're faced with a very sort of high kind of their inbox management is a real challenge. And if we think about it, one of the challenges, if this is all true, is they might start to get generated texts coming into their inbox. You don't want to listen to those. Those are, you know, Andre in St. Petersburg that is using ChatGPT to, to send a bunch of emails to the member of Congress. So there is a way in which we could think about using the same technology. And, and, and we know that, these, that, that this is out there because the way of the, these neural networks work, and you all know this better than I do, but is that they understand kind of what went into the output to be able to understand kind of that it was AI generated. So that's one possibility, or sort of a, this, these capabilities. Another is, what else do we know about generative AI? It's, it's able to do really thoughtful um, and visually appealing, or you can kind of front end it with a visually appealing dashboard that says, look, um, and I talked to a member of Congress last week. He said, and this is just one guy from New Hampshire, kind of sleepy, quiet New Hampshire, and he was a representative. He said he would get 60,000 emails a year. Uh, that's a lot of content. That's more emails than I think most of us get. And so he's trying to process these. And how does he, how does he kind of wrap his head around, or how's his staffer, because he's not reading most of these, um, 
<laughs> and again, kind of in a bless his heart kind of way. I mean, he was talking about kind of, oh, all of the emails he's getting from Bed Bath and Beyond and, you know, and, but the meat and like sifting through all of that, that the signal from the noise is really hard for these guys. Um, and so these tools can be used in the public interest. They can provide that summary almost in this data analytics kind of way. Um, Member of Congress, what did, your inter- what did your constituents care about this week? Were they for or against? That's really useful. And then lastly, that they, instead of, you know, this staffer saying, oh, this is a gun control email, I'm gonna drag and drop this email 31 from my pool. We also have ways to, and, and again, we've been developing these, uh, I've been working with computer scientists at Cornell to try to generate these tools that based on what the initial email says to provide both sentence and um, message level replies that engage directly with what the constituent actually expressed. So I'll just wrap up uh, with a few conclusions um, and say that these are, it is a really exciting time to be working in this space. Uh, and I, I think the political implications of these tools uh, are still being, uh, I, I think, are still being parsed. So it means clearly from this research that uh, that members of the public and our elected officials cannot tell the difference. And and I think there are a couple of implications there. Some are uh, somewhat dark, which is that. Um, What you can imagine, and this is something, the feedback we've gotten in the research we've done is that, and I see this from my undergrads, they say, well, we just don't believe anything we read online because it's it's online and that's why we don't believe it. And so this sort of tautological nihilism of they just don't believe anything. And as this sort of generative AI proliferates, that might be even, is likely to be even the more the case. And the problem with that is that in a democracy, trust is a, a fundamental pillar. The, on some level, you have to believe what your elected officials are telling you um, or believe what you read or else everything else kind of unravels from there. Uh, doing this in a large scale way, and I'd be happy to talk about this um, in, if, if anyone's interested, it is, and you probably have ideas on how to scale this better, but I will say that, that some of the uh, feedback we got from political elites on our experiment was pretty encouraging. Like there were little ways that they could identify that these these messages we sent were not totally authentic. But I think we have some work to do, which is that there needs to be um, more effort towards sort of thinking about digital literacy in new ways. That a lot of what we had thought about in terms of um, training members of Congress to not believe what is it, the Denver Post, which was like a made up newspaper, um, and think about the source and all of those kind of AI tools that proliferate after 2016 of like, how can you tell fake news from real news? Or is this a real outlet or not? I think NPR had a few of those on its site. That needs to be more dynamic because the technology is changing. Um, but I do think that there's a real opportunity here, which is to use these language models to help identify where those, some sift out some of those inauthentic messages and to connect legislators and their constituents and facilitate those really important uh, contacts and connections in the democracy. So I will leave it there with, it looks like four minutes to spare. Thanks everyone. Okay, well, thank you very much, Sarah, for that um, interesting talk. So in the talk, um, you presented both um, some dark scenarios as to how things will go wrong, but um, also some optimistic ways in which things could be perhaps improved. So I, I guess one of the huge questions is how will those balance out? Do, do you have any feelings like, you know, are the forces of dark just going to win? Or, you know, could this actually be um, lead to a new era in which there's actually much more effective communication between constituents and their members than there have been for the last century? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it's a great question, uh, Chris. And I know that the AI index that came out um, recently kind of tries to evaluate the risk of some of these technologies. And there's a lot of variation, um, you know, and I, I, and I think a lot of this comes down to kind of your, your worldview. Are you a technological optimist, which I find myself to be, um, or, 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 or do you place the risk at a at much, as we were talking about yesterday, is there are a lot of people who think that there's a 50% of the chance of the world ending because we're all going to like get eaten up by a paperclip, automated paperclip maker in the next 10 years. I, I, I'm not in that camp. So I recognize that maybe it's that I don't understand the threat well enough, but I, I do think that there are, that this technology is opening really fruitful doors uh, for so many things, including political communication. Ooh. Okay. Um, so I should have perhaps have even said by the beginning, um, for everybody who's in here in person, um, you're, if you have a question, you're encouraged to be able to ask it. And if so, it'd be great if you could come up to this microphone right here. Um, and uh, you can go first since you're closest to the microphone. Um, and, and then I'll also intersperse some other questions, both from people online and anything I think of to say. Uh, go for it. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you for sharing your amazing work. My name is Simba. Grass student here doing computational social science. My question for you is around politicians using these tools. So we have an election cycle coming up, and one of the things that I look for in a politician is critical thought, education, mm -hmm. and all these things. But with these tools that can say some of these things and produce these forms of media and text and all these things, what are your thoughts on that? Like, for example, let's say some election officials' uh, campaign team. You probably don't need five to six staffers anymore. You need a tool or something that can generate media for you, video, you touching puppies or whatever it is. How are you thinking through how they will use these tools to get political clout from the public and all these things? Thanks, Emma. That's a great question. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's so great to be out here at Stanford because people are thinking about the same kinds of questions that I am about kind of technology and how we think about it in a, a, a societally. Because there are all these questions about how to use these things in ways that don't fit frameworks, right? So your question, I think, is a really good one and one that I don't think we have great ways to, to know, you know, what are the expectations of an elected leader who's using these tools? Um, and so we've done, I didn't present this work, but we've done research on, on different kinds of disclosures and disclaimers um, because we don't think that ethically leaders should be just using a generative text tools without disclosing that. Uh, on the other hand, we've been talking to a lot of Congress people who say that's ridiculous because already we're just cutting and pasting and dragging and dropping, that this is actually better than the drag and drop that my staffers aren't even really reading. So I wonder whether, you know, again, I think this is really dynamic. So a uh, question of dis some form of disclosure and or, I mean, this <laughs> suggestion is, uh, is not, I, I think, in elected leaders' interest, but to say that they don't currently read these emails anyway. <laughs> and so, like, this is better than that. I think that's probably less likely. Um, but one thing, I, uh, so, uh, you know, these um, interviews I've been doing with elected officials on this point are really interesting because... Um, they reveal kind of the constraints that these elected officials are under. So this uh, financial end time. So I was talking to the mayor of Middletown, Connecticut last week, and he said he just replaced two HR people with a chatbot. <laughs> and he said it's great because they pay this tech company $20,000 a year to maintain this chatbot. And he told me the savings because of like the insurance and the this and the that of the people he'd have to hire. And this was a Democrat, you know, and, and so it's raising new kinds of questions. And, you know, someone will probably have to try this and get in trouble. And then we'll, you know, a, a trial and error for this to work out best. But I don't, I mean, and again, it's, it's one of these questions of like, so Gravel gives over his, his Twitter handle to these two teenagers. Is that, I mean, we could wonder about the ethics of that or not. And sort of whether what we're looking at here is qualitatively that different. Let me ask a related question from online. 
So somebody asked about what regulations should be implemented when AI is used to engage citizens. So, I mean, I think maybe what they have in mind is, well, you know, just like the worries from the Cambridge Analytica scandal, that here you could now have um, members of Congress um, micro-targeting their messages to different constituents to influence them as to how they think about things. And, well, maybe it should be disclosed or maybe that should just be disallowed. Um, and I was thinking about that for a moment. And then I was thinking, well, but sort of politicians do that already with human staffers who are crafting messages. Um, is it really worse or different? Right. And so I, I share that ambivalence, Chris. And, you know, it's sort of upon first blush, it seems like, yeah, you really need to disclose that. But then you start going down the, the sort of peeling back this onion and you realize, like, is it that different that we should feel like there's an ethical obligation to disclose? And I wonder if it's one of these things that in the initial iterations, the abundance of caution so that people don't you know, sort of come to distrust their member of Congress or the democratic process that you disclose it, but maybe over time as this becomes sort of so mainstream that that need to disclose is overcome by the just awareness that this is what political communication looks like now. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm from human biology and the center for teaching and learning. My name is Carlos Seligo and um, I'm an academic technology specialist. So I've been kind of watching this a lot <clears throat> and, I'm sure you have the same experience. You see the same, there's like almost like tropes. Here's the jobs trope. Here's the, and you're looking for something new. What I like that you did, maybe this is the benefit of being a researcher, is you often showed things relative to something else. So what would the New York Times efficacy be versus this thing or, or a human versus it, you know? And so, because there's never a baseline of nothing. And so I'm going to ask a qu basic question about this with, you know, my 20 year old son who has the same, Trust my friends on Discord, but everything else is, you know, an ironic thing. <laughs> and so, first of all, you know, not trusting people over 30 is normal. So that's not completely odd to think the whole thing is like, you know, lying, cheating adults. Um, but I think that this is an interesting case because we're used to the way that, I don't know, Russian disinformation made us fight with each other, right? That's a, a model we've been thinking about for a long time. But what about the one where it's the, it causes you to just shut down uh, trust because uh, it's easier just to be skeptical of everything? Mm -hmm. Now, the people that I think that are the most distrusting are the very old, which I know many in my personal life, and you hear about this with just demographic data, and they already kind of know what they think about vaccines and nothing's going to change it. But I'm the very young. So the middle group, mm -hmm. say between... We're kind of in it, you know, between like 25 and 60, right? They still have to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key thing. How does this affect decision making? If you have to make a decision on a vacation, like where am I going to go? You can't just say, oh, it's all BS, everything I read online. You have to choose. So the force to make a decision that politicians also have puts them in this place. How does the research you're doing or becoming more internet aware of how AI is affecting our process of thinking help or hurt? the decision-making process. It seems like that would be the ultimate, like how do I act once I decide what to believe in the information? Mm -hmm. anyway, it has a practical, you yeah. just have to make a choice. Do I get on the train or not? Yeah. <clears throat> do I vote or not at that point? Yeah, no, I mean, it's a great question. And I sort of, sort of want to punt by saying that it's still so early in this, all of this research and all of the technology to, I think, have a satisfying answer. I was just thinking about your, your question about or your, the thought on um, vacations and reviews. Like it took me a long time to realize uh, that I shouldn't read the five-star reviews. I need to read the one-star reviews. But like, so technology comes out and we familiarize ourselves with it. And then it takes time to figure out that you don't want to just see the glowing reviews. You want to see what the problems were. And so I wonder whether this is that kind of, technology of, well, we don't really know how people are interacting with it. We don't even know. I mean, there's so many studies still on what is the effect of exposure to fake news from the 2016 election. And it sounds like it was actually pretty minimal, even though there was a lot of it out there. Um, so I, 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 I mean, I think that's kind of the answer, which is that 
the technology is new, the studies are new, and these are in dynamic kind of relationship with each other. So I don't know that we know yet. Yeah. So one of the things that some people feel is that, yeah, generation will be really cheap, but maybe there's actually not that much um, damage because, you know, the things that are much more constrained are the ability to disseminate and the ability to get people's attention. I guess um, that is the viewpoint that the huge worry is what are people on Fox News saying, not what um, AstroTurf content is being put up on Twitter. Is, is yeah, that all the, yeah, I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> um, but, but so this paper that came out, the, one of my co-authors uh, on this is Maurice Chakesh, who just published with more Naman a piece in Kinas, um, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, that w that shows kind of as these to the sort of the generated text is basically filling itself in for the reader that that process is affecting how people think about the issue kind of the autofill you know the um and there is a persuasion aspect of that and so the question is a similar question how do we think about that do we do anything about it but it sounds like they're just these multiple kind of angles of persuasion and influence that we're still wrapping our heads around. Yeah. Um, let's see. There is there. So I think my question sort of intersects with, with that question of what is the bottleneck and what are the sort of harms, um, specifically from the misuse perspective that we should be worried about. Back in 2019, when we were doing our work assessing the credibility of uh, GPT-2 generated news stories, the threat model that we had in mind was text completions, right? These tools could be used to generate seemingly credible articles at scale. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't really see, or at least I didn't really see, and it didn't seem like Miles Brundage, our third co-author, really saw the instruction following capabilities of these models, right? We were really thinking in retrospect relatively narrowly about, you know, what could you do if you could make many, many news articles at scale? Um, but it turns out now we know that you know, the models available today can be used for a far broader range of tasks. And so now thinking back to the potentials for misuse, are there any other applications of these models beyond generating you know, credible sounding news articles or astroturfing content at scale that you're concerned about? Um, and uh, whether there's sort of an equal and opposite parallel on the optimistic positive use for these models side. Yeah, uh, really good question. Because you're right, GPT-2 uh, didn't even have the few-shot learning of, of GPT-3. So when we did these, um, so when we did the field experiment and we could essentially train GPT-3 based on what it had seen of our um, Cornell Political Union messages, then it had read all these and, could, and we could say, right, a right-wing message, we, which we could not do with GPT-2. We were all in completely that mode of like trying to scale credible messages. Um, but it really does change the landscape um, because, it, but it, it feels like it's a little bit harder to assess the threat landscape of this kind of the newer chat GPT um, thread in that kind of Russian vein. But I, I think maybe where I end up more optimistically, it seems like there are a lot of really interesting ways that political leaders can use that. Um, and not just political leaders. I mean, I've been talking to, you know, law firms in DC, so many constructive uses of it. Again, what I think is really interesting is, um, and I'm on a committee at Cornell trying to figure out what's appropriate in terms of chat GPT use on campus with students. Yeah. And we're all trying to figure these things out. Um, and so kind of, Again, it sort of sounds like a punting answer, but this technology that sort of, even though, and we were talking about this last night as well, we've worked on language models for many years, but there's something now with ChatGPT, with kind of following these instructions and the kind of creative scope of it that does feel different. And so I think it's such a new and mainstream. And the fact that you got 100 million users in the first month is crazy. A related question from online from... Jim Salzman, relate to new technology coming down the pike. Um, I guess um, he's not convinced how long the advantages of using voice are going to last. Um, how, how long will it be before we can have voice clone callers and fake calls and that 
um, phone calls will be just as bad as emails. <laughs> Yeah, I, I thought that as I was, I was saying it is it like, you know, it's the thing with technology is I say that now the, the, the voice cloning would be really hard to do at scale, but probably six months from now, we're going to be able to do this. Yeah, I mean, I think there's been a lot of technology advancement there, right? Like several companies, including OpenAI, have very good um, text-to-speech models right, with right. Whisper. And in particular, um, maybe some of you have been seeing them on social media, that there's been recent work on voice cloning. So you can now, with from just a few sentences actually produce pretty good voice clones of your favorite person. But the voice clone is maybe not even necessary for this calling into constituents. You just have to have some um, good text. Um, but let's take one more. Hi, my question is actually about the future of anonymous and pseudonymous speech. So as the cost of generating BS goes to zero, and of course you get this proliferation of this generated content, it seems plausible that uh, the importance of verified identity and authenticated identity becomes proportionally more important. Yeah. And uh, anonymous and pseudonymous speech, therefore, is where kind of the cesspool <laughs> lies. And so mm -hmm. I'm just kind of curious what you think the future of, of uh, implications for democracy are when specifically anonymous and pseudonymous speech is like completely considered not credible and maybe even has a chilling effect on people's willingness to speak anonymously and pseudonymously? Does it have an effect on, uh, in practice, uh, free speech and so forth? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good question. And it, it um, sort of reminds me of something that I didn't have a chance to say in this field experiment. One of the things we had to do um, was set up uh, like hundreds of Gmail accounts. I don't know if anyone's ever tried to do <laughs> Right, I think we had to get you to like be one of the phone numbers that could be the backup. I'm sure there are better ways to do this, but this was like sort of a real limitation. And actually, I'm thinking about the the um, voice cloning. Sort of, what are the limiting reagents, if you will, in pulling these things off? And I'm thinking about the phone lines. How many phone lines does a member of Congress have? Two. And there's there's a busy signal. If you're, <laughs> it's not like there's a call waiting. So you can only get, let's say, two people on a call at once. And uh, that staffer is, I mean, probably needs to be trained to kind of listen. And maybe there are, to, I'm sure there will be detection mechanisms. Uh, but, you know, as Amy was talking about last night that she, Amy Ziegert talks about always in her class, is there's always this measure countermeasure is that we can come up with detection mechanisms, but then the baddies are going to come up with the next thing that gets around around these. But I do think that sort of the verif so so one of the things with this field experiment that these members of Congress did kind of pick up on was the um, aliases of these Gmail accounts. You know, we're all like Bethany Smith too at you know gmail.com or whatever. And so they seemed sort of a bit contrived. And that did tip off some members of Congress. And so implicitly in their kind of threat mapping, they were looking for a version of verification that would give them a sense that this isn't just another spam, you know, and maybe they do that by looking for something like, um, at Goldman Sachs.com or something, you know, the, the, the big donors, no, but sort of a verification mechanism in their mind. Um, but I think, you know, as a sort of policy question, one of the things that really stands out in the interviews I've done with these elected officials is that, as with most things, we're always fighting the last war. All of the Congress spam filters are set up with 2016 in mind. Yeah. And they're not set up to think about these new technologies. So I better ask the most upvoted question online. I'm not actually sure if you're up for addressing it. I don't think I'd be up for addressing it, but here it is. Um, Nathan LeBen says GPT-4 abruptly recommended assassinations while he was testing it for open AI, providing a list of specific targets to other base models. Do you know about that? No, oh, I, I don't. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but I wonder if it still is. I mean, I think it's one of these things that open AI, as we were saying last night, I don't think they knew how wildly successful this would be and then how people would sort of boundary test with it. 
And so I think they've tweaked it. I wonder if you could still do the assassination thing or, you know, the sort of, and, and I don't know, I've, I see Scott Sagan in the audience on how to build a nuclear weapon. I think you could do that at one time. I don't think you can ask it that anymore. Okay, well, maybe we should take the next slide. <laughs> uh, thanks for a great presentation. Um, I'm Dennis. I work as a director for security and trustability of AI stuff for a company whose ambition is to seed the world with uh, acceleration of training and inferencing kinds of capabilities. So Vume is part of the problem. Um, in your work, you described uh, the efficacy of being able to uh, encourage engagement as a distinguish between human and uh, AI-generated text, that there was some efficacy to doing that, some impact. Mm -hmm. um, is there a get, a emerging any insight into the mechanism of the difference? Is it more mm -hmm. that it's the res reflexive responsiveness, moving the conversation on before anybody has a chance to do anything about it? Is it that saturate the discourse space, anything repeated loud enough, long enough is persuasive in some sense? Or is it that actual plausibility in the enough to persuade a fifth grader's sense or something else that I'm missing totally, or does it not make a difference? Oh, that's a really good question. So I'll um, say that we did not, have not looked at the mechanisms, but just kind of um, anecdotally thinking about the output of the, of, let's say a GPT generated tweet versus a human generated tweet. I mean, you know, members of Congress tend to be, uh, and I think probably should be risk averse. Um, not all our elected officials are uh, risk averse uh, or CEOs are risk averse in how they use social media. Um, and probably the ones who are most successful, you know, AOC, leans into just being so um, iconoclastic in some ways with it. But I think the modal person is thinking, I just don't want to get in trouble. Whereas a GPT-3 or chat GPT is all about kind of being clever. Um, and so I wonder if that's part of the difference is that these, the generated tweets don't have a sense of caution and risk aversion that an elected official probably would and should. And that's another sort of question. And I think that's where, because we're at a, um, the, the human-centered AI institution where the human really should remain in the loop on this. So you don't want to just kind of take the output and just plug and chug. You still want to have eyes on it and see whether it makes sense, see whether it's courteous, see whether it um, is ethical, see whether this is somehow promoting suicidal thoughts or whatever, you know, that you want to guard against that. And so I think maybe yeah, bringing, making sure that the human remains in the loop, I think is something that actually hasn't come up, but I think is really important here. Okay, so um, we've gone to a few minutes past 11, so I think we would probably about um, need to wrap it up. But thank you, Sarah, very much for this, you know, interesting, thought-provoking um, presentation. And I really appreciated both sort of, the clearly um, necessary warnings as to how things can go badly wrong. But on the other hand, the optimism that are, they're actually good use cases. I mean, one of the things I was left thinking of, you know, in terms of these issues of how to get um, Congress people more au fait with technology, you know, maybe what we should be doing is working out how to deploy customized systems for analyzing inboxes and generating replies. If people in Congress were actually using those systems and they were helping them, um, wouldn't that be a great new um, way in which we'd build understanding and mm -hmm. usefulness at the same time? That is the hope. Yep. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone.